In this first part of the lecture covering the pharmacology of drugs used for treatment of cancer, we are going to discuss anti-cancer enzymes and hormonal therapy. But first things first, let's briefly discuss what cancer is and how it develops. So cancer is generally defined as the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in the body. While the normal cell growth is carefully regulated to meet the needs of the whole organism, cancer cells evade normal controls regulating cell proliferation and survival. Now in order to get a better understanding of how this happens, first we need to review the cell cycle. So when a cell receives message to divide, it goes through a process known as the cell cycle, which includes several phases for the division to be completed. The cycle starts with the first gap phase, known as G1 phase during which the cell grows in size and prepares enzymes for DNA replication. At this point, under certain conditions, cell can exit the cell cycle and remain in the so-called G0 phase as non-dividing, non-growing, quiescent cell. But if the cell progresses, the cell will enter the second phase, known as the S or synthesis phase, in which DNA replication occurs. During this phase, the cell makes an identical copy of each of its chromosomes. After this, the cell moves to a G2 or second gap phase, in which it continues to grow and prepares itself to divide. The final phase of the cycle, known as the M or mitosis phase, is the point at which the cell division occurs. Now, the process for mitosis itself is divided into a few different stages. The main stages are prophase, during which chromosomes appear condensed and nuclear envelopes breaks down, metaphase, during which the network of microtubules growing from the centrioles at the cell poles align the chromosomes in the middle of the cell, anaphase, during which the chromosomes are separated and move to the opposite sides of the cell, and lastly, telophase and cytokinesis, during which nuclear membranes form around the separated chromosomes and cell walls pinch off, bringing about the separation into two daughter cells. Immediately following the M phase, newly formed cells either leave the cycle and become dormant, or return to the G1 phase should they need to divide again. Now, because cell cycle is a continuous process, surveillance mechanisms known as checkpoints exist to ensure each phase is completed properly before progression to the next stage. The three main checkpoints are the G1 checkpoint, the G2 checkpoint, and the M checkpoint. Now it's important to remember that not all cells have to pass through each of these checkpoints in order to replicate. Many types of cancer are caused by mutations in tumor suppressor genes that allow the cells to speed through the various checkpoints or even skip them altogether. So one of the common approaches in treatment of cancer is to use chemotherapy agents that target fast dividing cells at different phases of the cell cycle. Generally, those drugs that are cytotoxic during specific phase of the cell cycle are referred to as cell cycle specific drugs. On the other hand, drugs that are cytotoxic in any phase of the cell cycle are referred to as cell cycle non-specific drugs. So now let's explore these drugs in more details, starting with the ones acting in G1 phase. During this phase, the cell synthesizes majority of proteins that are needed later on for DNA replication and cell division. One of the building blocks of many of those proteins is an amino acid called asparagine. Now, healthy non-malignant cells can synthesize asparagine with the help of the enzyme asparagine synthase. However, some tumor cells such as leukemic cells, lack this enzyme and depend on exogenous supply of asparagine for their survival. This is where a drug called asparaginase come into play. Asparaginase is an enzyme that speeds up the breakdown of asparagine into aspartic acid and ammonia. This results in the depletion of asparagine, inhibition of protein synthesis, cell cycle arrest in the G1 phase, and ultimately apoptosis in susceptible leukemic cell population. <laughs> For patients with acute lymphocytic leukemia who develop an allergy to asparaginase, there is a slightly changed version of the drug available called pegaspergase, 
which is essentially asparaginase linked to polyethylene glycol molecule. In contrast to asparaginase, pegaspergase is less likely to cause allergic reaction, has longer duration in the body and can be given less frequently. Now the progress from G1 to S phase depends on the actions of molecular pathways that are influenced by hormone regulated genes. The primary hormone that has been implicated in the promotion of carcinogenesis, especially in tissues of the female reproductive tract and the breast, is estrogen. The majority of the cellular effects of estrogen are mediated through intracellular estrogen receptors, abbreviated here as ER. Upon binding of estrogen to the estrogen receptor in the cytoplasm, a conformational change occurs, inducing receptor dimerization. This complex then is translocated to the nucleus, where it binds to specific regions on chromatin, thereby activating the transcription of specific genes, leading to increased cell growth and proliferation rate. Now there are four ways in which estrogen dependent processes important in development of certain cancers such as breast cancer may be interrupted. So the first and the most direct method to reduce the amount of estrogen in the body is to simply interfere with its production by targeting an enzyme called aromatase. The aromatase enzyme is substantially concentrated in adipose and hepatic tissues and is also found in elevated concentrations in breast cancer. It is primarily needed for the conversion of androstenedione and testosterone to estron and estradiol respectively. Estron and estradiol are biologically active estrogens, which bind to and activate estrogen receptors thereby promoting cell proliferation. Aromatase inhibitors such as anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestane work by blocking aromatase enzyme, which in turn reduces the production of estrogens, particularly in postmenopausal women. Now the second estrogen sequestering method is to interfere with the binding of estrogen to the estrogen receptors. This can be accomplished with the use of selective estrogen receptor modulators, SERMS for short, such as tamoxifen and raloxifene. In hormone receptor positive cancer cells, these agents competitively bind to the estrogen receptor protein and adopt a different conformation to the one seen with estrogen bound. The complex then dimerizes and it's transported from the cytosol into the cell's nucleus where it binds to DNA to form a new complex that is unable to function in the same way as the one formed with estrogen. The overall result is the inhibition of growth promoting effects of estrogen. Now the third method is to reduce or eliminate estrogen receptor expression. This can be accomplished with the use of selective estrogen receptor down regulator, such as fulvestrin, which works by binding to estrogen receptor monomers and inhibiting receptor dimerization. This in turn leads to accelerated receptor degradation, thus making the receptor unavailable to estrogen. Now the last approach to reduce estrogen levels is to suppress ovaries, which are the main source of estrogen, particularly in premenopausal women. The ovaries produce and secrete estrogens in response to follicle stimulating hormone, FSH for short, and luteinizing hormone, LH for short, which are released from the pituitary gland when signaled by the hypothalamus. To carry its message, the hypothalamus produces a chemical signal in the form of gonadotropin releasing hormone, GnRH for short, which exerts its stimulatory effects by activating GnRH receptors expressed on the pituitary gland. Now these receptors are the target of GnRH agonists, such as luprolide, gozerolin, and triptorelin, which work by overstimulating GnRH receptors, resulting in receptor desensitization over time. This in turn leads to reduced secretion of luteinizing hormone and a follicle stimulating hormone and ultimately reduced production of estrogen. Although GnRH agonists can be helpful in treatment of women with breast cancer, they are more often used in treatment of men with prostate cancer. This is because in males luteinizing hormone directs the testes to produce testosterone. Free circulating testosterone can enter prostate cells where with the help of 5-alpha reductase enzyme, it can be converted to its more potent metabolite dihydrotestosterone 
and then bind to the androgen receptor, abbreviated here as AR. This hormone receptor complex then dimerizes with another hormone-bound receptor and translocates into the nucleus where it binds to specific DNA sequences, thus triggering expression of genes involved in cell growth and proliferation. Now, because GnRH agonists initially stimulate pituitary gland leading to surge in testosterone levels and under certain circumstances a flare-up of the tumor, scientists have been developing GnRH antagonists that do not cause surge in testosterone or clinical flare. Example of this is an agent called Degorelix, which works simply by blocking the receptor for gonadotropin-releasing hormone in the pituitary gland, thereby reducing the release of the luteinizing hormone, causing a rapid, sustained suppression of testosterone release from testes, and subsequently reducing the size and growth of the prostate cancer. Now, another approach to reduce the effects of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone is to interfere with their binding to the androgen receptor. This can be accomplished with the use of so-called non-steroidal antiandrogens, such as flutamide, bicalutamide, and nilutamide, which work by binding to androgen receptors and competitively inhibiting their interaction with testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, thus preventing the effects of these hormones in the prostate gland. Now, the last treatment option usually reserved for prostate cancer that is not responding to androgen deprivation therapies that we have discussed so far is a drug called abiraterone. The target of this drug is an enzyme called cytochrome p 450 17 alpha hydroxylase CYP17A1 for short, which is expressed in testicular, adrenal and prostate cancer cells and is responsible for the conversion of androgen precursors to testosterone. Abiraterone works simply by inhibiting CYP17A1 enzyme, thus disrupting androgen synthesis, thereby reducing serum levels of testosterone and other androgens within these tissues, and ultimately leading to shrinkage of hormone-sensitive prostate cancer cells. Now, when it comes to side effects, asparaginase and pegaspergase may cause fatigue and poor appetite, mouth sores, pancreatitis, and blood clots. Aromatase inhibitors, as well as GnRH agonists and antagonists, may cause fatigue, muscle and joint pain, hot flashes and osteoporosis. Selective estrogen receptor modulators, for the most part, share similar side effects, in addition to being more likely to cause blood clots, stroke and endometrial cancer. Lastly, antiandrogens, when used in men, may cause breast enlargement, hot flashes, sexual dysfunction, and osteoporosis. And with that, I wanted to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, stay tuned for more.